February is Black History Month, and who but the whitest of all men to discuss black history? And rather than picking something recent and topical, I decided to go way, way back and pick a truly obscure topic so that there's no way I could trigger an internet culture war. What would you say if I told you that one of the most important events in black American history was the invention of this tiny little box that looks like something out of the horror movie Saw? And what would you say if I also told you that this tiny box in fact did torture millions of black Americans over decades and affected millions more of other people around the world. Will it be true? This is the cotton gin. And let me show you how world of the cotton gin would be unbelievably different, with different borders, demographics, culture, and the rest of history taking a quite different route. That is the question of this alternate history. So our story starts in 1793 Georgia. Eli Whitney, a Connecticut Yankee, certainly not in King Arthur's court, was in the South working as a tutor before he met Catherine Littlefeld Green. She was the widow of the badass and completely underrated American Revolutionary War General Nathaniel Green, and she and Whitney quickly became friends and he stayed at her plantation. While he was in the South, he was experimenting mechanically and invented the cotton gin. For those of you who don't know, the cotton gin changed the production of cotton completely. Before this, cotton was a luxury product because each individual seed out of the cotton plant had to be picked out manually before it could be processed. Well, the cotton gin allowed this to be done mechanically, which allowed production to just shoot through the roof. This had revolutionary effects upon the world, especially the American South. Cotton became a staple of cloth production, with the factories of the American North, the UK, and France depending upon cotton. And I'm guessing the percentage of you that are at least wearing one cotton item on you right now is very high. Slavery was declining in power and productivity before the cotton gin. The founding fathers, almost to a man, were against slavery. Although they've been blacklisted by the left as horrifying slaving monsters, George Washington freed his slaves upon his death, while Thomas Jefferson championed bills to illegalize slavery in America. The Virginia slave owning elite was an enormous debt to the oversupply of tobacco, their main crop on the global market, and thus were pretty passive at actually getting rid of slavery, and just hoped it would eventually die out. During the American Revolution, it was assumed by everyone that slavery would eventually run out of steam and be peacefully abolished over the next few decades. The cotton gin, meanwhile, was like a tsunami that completely changed the direction of American attitudes towards slavery. Before it, tobacco, the main crop of American slavery, was losing profitability. However, with the invention of the cotton gin and industrialization, cotton could make good money. This meant that rather than disdaining slavery in a passive way, slavery and its propagation became a sort of religion among many in the South. It's interesting to read some of the founding documents of the Confederacy that would say stuff like this. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth, that the negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world, based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. A huge shift was the redistribution of power in the South from Virginia, which looks like this, to the deep South of the Cotton Belt, which looks like this. This never would have taken place in this world, with the Deep South remaining very poor and underpopulated. This area isn't really good for growing much besides cash crops like cotton, and the climate was unhealthy and malarial for whites. The center of the South had remained further north, and climates healthier for white Americans in states like Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Virginia dealt with the early 19th century very badly. Tobacco ruined the soil quality, and at the same time, the very hierarchical and semi-feudal state of its society meant that the development of towns, industry, and social mobility was very difficult. At the same time, slavery is in general quite detrimental to the development of advanced open economy. And I've gotten to a lot of detail over this in my What If the Atlantic Slave Trade video never happened, the link to which is in the description. But here is the easy slow chart version. Virginia was suffering a terrible depression and was thus hemorrhaging population to the migration west many of them slaves migrating to the Cotton Belt. Virginia, in fact, contributed more people to the settlement of the western states than all the states of the northern United States combined. The northern states dealt with their excess population by building cities and factories. 
options Virginia couldn't do due to slavery. The Virginians actually realized the biggest reason for their economic decline was slavery, which is an enormous amount of self-awareness for any society, and got close to abolishing it in 1831. However, there were two issues that prevented them from doing so. First of which was that they could still make revenue off selling slaves to the growing cotton belts, even if they weren't making much money off tobacco. And this meant that slavery was still seen as a philosophy of the future and tenable in the future. And at the same time, they also didn't know what to do with the enormous free black population that would develop from an abolition of slavery. Virginia followed by South Carolina were the dominant cultural forces in the South at this time. And so if Virginia abolished slavery, many other Southern states would likely follow. The last would likely be South Carolina, which would still like be able to profit from slavery from crops like rice and indigo. But as popular opinion and the other states would turn against it, South Carolina too in the end would likely abolish it. And this would mean that slavery would be peacefully abolished in the 1830s and 40s in the United States. The second major shift would be that there would be no trail of tears. This was when the United States evicted its native populations from the southeastern part of the country and moved them west of the Mississippi. And this was a hugely controversial decision at the time and barely passed through Congress. Firstly, for moral reasons, but more importantly, because the northern states were worried that with the opening up of all this land in the south, it would result in the southern states becoming too powerful. But with these regions simply being less economically valuable without cotton, it would mean that the Trail of Tears would never happen, and these native tribes would remain powerful forces inside this region even today. The Southern social order run into issues with the enormous free black population that would emerge from emancipation. Like in our timeline, there's no way they would divide up the estates of wealthy whites to make space for the new free blacks. So instead, sadly, like in our world, the blacks would likely become poor farmhands and sharecroppers. This was an age that believed very strongly in white superiority, and so the blacks likely wouldn't get equal legal rights to whites for a very long time. A nasty apartheid system would likely replace slavery. The large malarial regions of the Gulf Coast South would have no value for whites, but the blacks would have immune abilities due to sickle cell anemia, would be able to deal with the tropical diseases, and thus would be able to settle. We would start to see independent black settlements develop in the Deep South, even as racist legislatures would keep the best lands in the states for whites. The U.S. would have annexed less of the Southwest in the Mexican-American War. Areas that would have appeared like worthless desert to northern-style agriculture looked like good irrigatable land for cotton growing. I mean, hell, Arizona is one of the highest cotton-producing states now for reasons that are entirely beyond me. Thus, the U.S. got a stretch of desert that includes modern cities like Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix, or Las Vegas. There would, of course, be no civil war in this timeline. Without slavery, there would have been no catalyst for it. And the Civil War had an enormous unifying effect on the United States. Just for an example, before the Civil War, the United States was referred to as a plural, as these United States. After the war, it was the United States. And so people stopped viewing the U.S. as a collection of states working in a confederacy and more as a single government. The Civil War didn't kill states' rights by beating the Confederacy. It killed states' rights by forcing the country to work together as a single organization to wage total war. We would see more industrialization in the South in this timeline. The biggest thing holding back the South's economy was slavery and racial hang-ups, and without it, the South would develop earlier. This would likely be concentrated in the Upper South in areas like Virginia and Kentucky that would be the closest to having a temperate climate and the industrial centers of the North. Black Americans would be in a much better place. Firstly, there wouldn't be the underlying current of resentfulness and bitterness in the part of Southern whites from the Northerners forcing them to abolish slavery and thus staining their honor. Secondly, black Americans would have a 30-year head start after the abolition of slavery, and at the same time they would have their own independent source of leadership from the black communities on the Gulf. If you wanted to ascribe lessons to these videos, at least one of them for this topic would be that a large part of the South's history we saw in our timeline as largely agricultural, white supremacist, and bitter did not have to happen, and was a result of specific events in history as much as anything else. And the fact that over the last 50 years in our world, the South has been able to claw itself out of this and become a wealthy and racially integrated area is demonstrative of this. In the second half of the 20th century, the South would become much wealthier due to the rise of air conditioning and DDT, which made the southern lowlands habitable for white people. This is how Florida went from being a swamp to one of the most populous states in the Union in a few decades. 
This would result in an influx of money into an underpopulated area and also bring money and investment to the black and native communities in the region, leading to their rise in wealth and influence. The cotton gin would likely be invented at some later point. I'm guessing around 1895, which is a number I totally pulled out of my ass, but it was an era in which a lot of things were invented. In general, it could have been invented at any point. It's a very simple mechanical tool, and you'd think it would be the sort of thing that the ancient Greeks would have invented around the birth of Christ. However, once industrial bulk commodities get established, they become parts of their societies and difficult to change. For example, the reason Americans eat so much beef and not lamb, even though it's a nation of British descent, is that the American beef industry was genius at industrializing, and we just sort of got used to it. Or the reason Americans use ice in their beverages is that America was a center of ice production in the 19th century, even though today many countries in the world could get ice as easily as Americans. If the economies of scale existed for wool or hemp, they would continue to exist for wool and hemp, and cotton would not have made as large a dent. This would be a great boon for areas like Australia, Argentina, New Zealand, Canada, or the American Plains, which would develop enormous wool industries to clothe the world. Cotton would likely get a market eventually, as it's better for warm climates. However, it would likely remain inferior to wool. There are a few areas outside of the United States that became dependent upon cotton in our world. The first was Egypt, which would still be colonized by the British, since the Suez Canal would be vital for reaching India. In this timeline, if cotton was discovered later, India with its pre-existing enormous labor force and being an enormous cotton producer in our timeline would likely supply most of the demand. After the 1930s, machines would be able to do the labor of cotton harvesting, and thus it wouldn't change the societies that would grow cotton that much. So to go to another region on Earth, here is a geographic map of the greater Near East at the birth of Christ compared to the present. What differences do you see? Firstly, Kuwait has come into existence due to silt from the Tigris and Euphrates, and secondly, a sea vanished in Central Asia. This is the Aral Sea, which the Soviet Union destroyed in the 20th century in an attempt to turn Central Asia into the Soviet Union's cotton belt. They succeeded at this, but also succeeded at destroying the water supply flowing into the Aral Sea, since cotton is a very water-intensive crop, therefore drying it up. So yet another thing to attach to the list of things that communism has killed. What a faultist, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please comment, like, subscribe, and if you do, please click the bell icon that means you're notified whenever I release new content, or give me $1,000 via Patreon. All equally good options except the last one. And as always, thank you for watching, and have a good day.